through what I did in adventure, how I finished my undergrad, what I'm doing now, and feel free to stop me at any time if you guys have any questions, because um, I don't know what you guys would want to know unless you ask me. So um, I guess I'm just going to begin with, I do define myself as a writer, editor, and content creator. Hi, I see more faces. <laughs> Good to see you guys. Um, yeah, so I don't really, I do identify as a journalist, but I typically just say writer, editor, content creator, because I find that all these skills kind of just like merge into one another. So for example, if in another six months, I wanted to move to another degree, like having a base like this, lets me move into PR, lets me move into publishing, lets me move into, you know, um, creative writing, tutoring, things like that. So um, I suppose what I'd say is if you have an interest in reading, in writing, in, I don't know, how are you? In, um, how are you doing? I'm doing well. <laughs> so yeah, if you have an interest in writing, reading, hearing stories, sharing stories, then a career in the media can be so fascinating. It can be exhausting, it can be thrilling, but I suppose that's possibly the case with most careers. Um, in adventure, I studied English literature and history along with eco and business studies. So I was somewhere in the middle there. And um, I graduated in 2014. I ended up going to Flame University where I finished my BA in literary and cultural studies. And that kind of means doing a little bit of, well, everything. Because I did a little bit of um, history, a little bit of archaeology, and I had a minor in journalism. So what that uh, also means... Yeah, just a second. Um, if anyone's uh, mic is on, if you can please mute yourself. Thank you. Please mute yourself. Yeah, please go ahead, Ria. Sure. Okay. Oh, that I can. <laughs> that's so much better already. I didn't even notice before. And um, yeah, so my degree was literary and cultural studies with a minor in journalism. And that kind of means you do a little bit of everything. So there was a little bit of archaeology, history, and it was academic in the sense of I initially went into college wanting to be a writer. You know, like I told myself that in three years I'll be a successful novelist and I'll be on a book tour and things like that, which is of course possible. Not to say that it's not, but at some point I did realize that I did want to also study something else. Like I wanted to have a base in more than just literature, but kind of just cultural studies, let's say. Because, for example, if you guys love movies, if you love Game of Thrones, things like that, there's a lot of introspection you can also do about what's good about it, what's not good about it, what, where can it be improved, what is the story that it's telling us, what is the history that it like draws upon, because Game of Thrones also kind of pulls from so much history, right? So I, I loved learning about that, and that's why I kind of just diverted a little bit, but you know, the storytelling love always remained. And a very cool opportunity that I got when I was an undergrad is that as part of your degree, everybody, no matter what you're studying, has to do um, a research project, which is choosing a topic, working on a, a report, working on a presentation, working on an exhibition, and going somewhere in India to study an art form. And my group studied Kavali. I'm sure you guys might, you know, the stuff from Bollywood, so like Kun Faya Kun and Khwaja Mere Khwaja, but like that's obviously the Bollywood version of it. So we went to Nizamuddin Dargah and we got to study that. And it was a fascinating experience. We ended up, um, because of that, I got a chance to go to Zanzibar. So it's this little island just off the coast of Africa. And it essentially gave, gave me the basic skills, let's say, that I would need later to be a journalist. Because you just walk down a street and you start a conversation with someone, you know, because people aren't just going to come up to you and share information. And after, did I, anyone have any questions, by the way? Until now. Okay, cool. I must be doing a good job, I hope. <laughs> and um, yes, so one of the major takeaways that I learned when I was doing my degree was the importance of internships. So honestly, one big thing that I talk about now with you guys 
is just when you see internship opportunities, really make the most of it. In my three or in my four year degree, I did three internships. So I did a bit of content writing for um, a not for profit that helps homeless uh, homeless dogs. I um, did an internship with Let's uh, with um, Little Black Book Bangalore. So you know. Um, the website that you go to to like get restaurant reviews or like you guys know a little black book right okay cool and um i also did an internship with scroll the website which was my first internship as a journalist technically and after i graduated one of my professors put me in touch with a publisher at penguin random house which was my opportunity to kind of like cut my teeth in publishing because it always looks so glamorous, right? Like getting to read as a career and getting to like figure out what's gonna be the next bestseller. So I really wanted to learn more about that. And that was the fourth internship I, I did in four years, I'd say. And it made all the difference because I was fascinated. I, I worked there for about two and a half, three months. And it was such a cool opportunity. Um, in publishing, there, there's obviously multiple departments, so there's marketing and things like that, but I worked for Puffin, which is children's and young adult literature, and I worked in the copy editing department, which means the people who literally sit and read it sentence by sentence and make any corrections, but I also got a chance to work in commissioning. So commissioning is essentially people sending their stories and you decide this is a good story, this should be published, or this is not a good story, we might pass on this. So as the intern, you're basically just like given the slush pile, which is what it, they call it. And it's your job to kind of just like read through and just decide what you think is a really good book that they should definitely think about. And it was cool. I, I spent my days just reading 100 pages from like 9 a.m. to 5 p.m. If it was good, I'd pass it on. If it wasn't good, I'd be like, sorry, guys, next time. <laughs> and um it was very cool. Honestly, I wanted to continue working there, but then they were just like, you need to get a master's degree because Penguin. So that's when I kind of figured, you know what, I think that I need to like continue my education. And at the time, I was also particularly interested in journalism, in the media. Um, my time at Scroll, my time at LBB had taught me all these different types of writing. And I knew that that's kind of what I wanted to do. I just need to figure out exactly what form. Because if you think back to all the kinds of writing, one is entertainment journalism, one is lifestyle journalism, one is publishing. And like I said, these are all transferable degree, like transferable skills. So if you like to read, if you like to listen to people tell their stories, it's a great platform. And um, that kind of led me to the University of Sydney because I thought they had a fascinating degree. This as well is kind of a combination of many things. I learned the software that they use to literally make magazines. I um, learned how to make a podcast last year and again, COVID year. So I was like recording myself with my blanket on top of me in my bedroom, you know, just making sure there was no echo. And um, Along, along the way, I've kind of realized that like there's a lot of cool things happening in the world. And especially here in Australia, I work in the multicultural media, which means that it's, um, it's for Indian Australians, it's for South Asian Australians. And it's something that we don't often realize when we're living in India. But when we, when we move away, um, there's a lot of stories that go untold, you know, like... Indian Australians who are doing very cool things that the mainstream media not, might not be picking up on. Research, important research that's being done at universities by Indian origin professors. So that's the kind of stories that I knew that I wanted to work on while I was here. And it's it's been so weird being a journalist during the pandemic, you know, like I'm, I do Zoom interviews like this and it's really not the same as just, you know, sitting down and having a cup of coffee with someone and just like, finding out their story. Instead, this is just Zoom calls and phone calls. And it's 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 a bizarre situation, but like it really teaches you to just like learn on the job, really. And yeah, I'm sure that there's a lot that I missed out on <laughs> in telling the story, but 
I guess this is essentially what what kind of led me here. And did anyone have any questions so far? Because I mean, I did before this kind of like note down a couple of things that I feel like you sh people should definitely know about a career in the media before they agree to it because it's not easy. But I'm I'm happy to answer some questions first. Yes, Ramesh. Yeah, I was wondering uh, how did how did you feel that the A levels prepared you for going to um, a liberal arts college here in India? Do you think that they provided for a smooth transition for you? Okay, that's a great question. I definitely did not address high school too much. Okay, so um, before I moved to Adventure as well, I was at DPS, so I was in like CBSE. And immediately when I came to Adventure, I noticed such a difference in the way that like the A-levels approach a subject because the way that I was taught before was just, this is everything that happened, know it. But then when I moved to the A-levels, it was, this is everything that happened. Why did it happen? What else could have happened? What next? You know, like it was more than just knowledge. And I love that aspect. It, it, it opened my eyes to the way you think about history, to the way you think about literature, you know? And over those two years, I had like, it really built a very good base because eventually when I went to Flame University, and again, let me just address why I went to Flame as well. Because like, I'm sure that many of you, especially in the 11th and 12th would know, like a lot of people before COVID were constantly going to like the UK, to the US and stuff like that. And it does sometimes, maybe this is just me if this is you as well that's perfectly fine but sometimes you feel this pressure you know like i should also be going to an american college but my parents were like pretty clear at the time that they're like you know what we're not ready to send you yet we don't think you're ready to live in a different country by yourself so please look in india and then knowing what my interests were at the time which is literature and english but not in the conventional like learn shakespeare learn all of the great poets and the great writers the way that a lot of indian colleges do admittedly approach the subject that's when i knew that i kind of wanted to do liberal arts and at the time i think there were maybe two um universities available to us and i ended up picking flame and to address the question the way that it, the A-levels really prepared me is that one, you're already kind of taught to think differently, right? Like as compared to a lot of other people who might not be coming from the same syllabus, you know that, okay, when you see a topic, who, what, when, where, why, how does it impact me? How does it impact the world? Like you just, many of you might not even notice it, but I realized it years after leaving Inventure that there's kind of like a little bit of a shift. Like you just start to think a little bit more critically and a little bit more as a, to use a cheesy term, global citizen, because um, we're not living in like a little bubble, right? We're living in like part of a much larger ecosystem. And yeah, that's why liberal arts as well is a great um, platform for many of you to consider if you're not quite sure what you wanna do, because you get exposure to many different subjects. And to be fair, every subject teaches you to think a little bit differently. You know, like I did statistics at one point in the first year and I was, terrible i haven't done math since the 10th grade you know but it made a difference because like today when as a journalist if i have to interview a professor and you know they they talk to me a little bit about their math i'm not amazing at it i definitely need to read up about it but i i kind of understand a little bit about where they're coming from and i think it's so underrated you know like this having a little bit of knowledge and everything so yeah, I hope that answered the question. I went on a tangent, but yeah. And did anyone else have any questions? Yes, Mother, please go ahead. Guys, don't raise your hand. Just. Yeah. Oh, okay. Okay. So, did you ever face any difficulty like making an uninteresting topic like a really good article? Okay, that is also a very good question. So, um, I guess one thing that you definitely learn, especially when you're starting off as a journalist, is that like people don't come and just give you an interesting story, right? So much of your job is just spent searching, like trolling Twitter, trolling Facebook, trolling anything, just looking for something that grabs your eye. And um, then maybe you find it, maybe you're like, you know what, this is a very cool story. But 
maybe only I find it interesting. And that's happened to me in certain uh, situations, you know. Um, last year, I interviewed a PhD student of Indian origin, and she won a university award for like a little um, device that she's created, which can help you get your get get your results of like your kidney levels, like for lack of a better word, like the health of your kidney essentially. Like you can do the test at home, and your device kind of does the test for you. And then the results get sent to your doctor, which is obviously perfect for COVID times when you can't always meet your doc, meet your doctor face to face. But it was painfully boring to like have to write out, right? Because like, how do you get into the science of this is this is how it works, and this is why you should know about it. But the interesting thing comes out when you realize that you find it boring after you have heard everything about it. But for someone who is always hearing a story for the first time. You kind of need to sell it, but once you put that initial base and they've started reading the first paragraph or so, or even if it's a catchy headline, as clickbaity as that sounds, if you write it well, people just keep reading, honestly. So it's just about finding out, finding that little thing that keeps the person interested, say, and then just sharing a story well, sharing a story powerfully. And yeah, just I have a very hard time with. Sometimes I, sometimes is an understatement, I often like overthink and I keep wondering like, oh, who's going to really care about this? But that's a very limited perspective. And honestly, a lot of people care about these things. You just need to be the person to share that story. Thank you. Of course. Hi, Dia. I'm Sneha. How are you? Hi, how are you? I'm doing very well. How are you? I'm good, thank you. Do you find that journalism in Sydney is very different from journalism in Bangalore? I knew that question was coming. <laughs> <laughs> if yes, I want, to I want to hear the good and the not so good. Thank you. Okay, that is fair. And um, <laughs> I knew it was going to come. Like I was wondering whether I should mention it myself, but it's it's of course a very loaded topic to talk about what's happened in the media especially in the last like decade or so you know this idea of the truth and then a version of the truth which is you know it's it's a funny thing to think about now and as journalists you know like you're always because there's so many platforms people get their information from so many places that everybody feels like you know like it's my job to get like get there first which can lead to like a lot of inaccuracy or to just sell it as more than it really is, you know, like to oversell a story, to have like a super clickbaity headline that makes people come for the views, but you're not really saying much at all. And in India, especially, um, it was uh, it's something that comes up all the time. When I worked in India for a little while, there were stories that I wanted to say. And sometimes my editor was just like, this is a very tough topic to address. I, I don't think we can run this. And then, you know, you you feel censored by the very place that's giving you a platform. And then, and it, it's it's a very tough feeling to know. For example, if um, let, this was what, eight years ago, when I, if I wanted to write a story about a gay couple that I knew and everyone was just like, yeah, you can't name them. You can't write about it because it's, it's not a subject that people want to read. It was, it was just not a subject that the platform was willing to like fight for, I guess, because there's a lot of hate online as well. Um, anyway, so in India, this is not this is not to sell turn anybody off the Indian media scene because there is very good, important work being done now more than ever. But it just means that things are a little trickier in India based on what I've experienced. And I can't say that it gets that much easier in Sydney either because everybody feels like they know best when they've read it from 10 different sources. And there's so much diligence that needs to be done when you work in the media. And that was actually one of the points that I was going to bring out in my ending notes, let's say, where I should just mention it now, which is there's a lot of courage in being a journalist in the sense of something goes under your name. If there's anything wrong about a story, if there's anything inaccurate, if there's anything that someone else disagrees with, you're the person that they're going to take it up with. You know, they're not going to take it up with your editor because Ria is the only name that they're going to know for this. And it's a it's 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 scary. 
um, in Sydney, for example, there was a there was an Indian origin man who was arrested um, related to the farmer protests and things like that. And I won't get into the background of it because it's still in court. But essentially, there were a lot of um, right wing people in the diaspora here who did not believe our story whatsoever. And we used to get calls in the office every day, you know, asking us where our address is, asking us like, meet me here and I will give you a piece of my mind. And that's petrifying, you know, that to hear someone like threaten you over the phone, it's not something that happens all the time, thankfully, but it's, it's a part and parcel of the job because you're the one sharing the story, let's say. Um, so I would say that it's very important to have thick skin, but it's also important to embrace like a sensitive approach because when it comes to really difficult topics, like for example, if you're talking about a death, let's say, you're, te- you're talking about something that you're not going through, but it's really emotional for someone else. So there's a lot of strength in in being brave, but also kind of... Sorry, Mokul, did you have something to say? What if it's a death of a really bad person? Sorry, I, I What didn't if, hear that. like, someone who was really, really bad died? Then, like, and everybody basically hated them. Then, well, I mean, okay, so that happens, too. Um, and that's where, you know, like, this idea of a media ethics, you know, like a journalist code of ethics really comes to play because oftentimes you can't just let your personal feelings get involved. So whether you really loved someone or really hated them, you just got to talk about them like they're any person on the street. It's very hard. That's what, you know, private Twitters are for. But as a journalist, um, it's still your job to tell a story honestly and fairly regardless of feelings. Have there been times when you had like some sort of maybe like uh, side, like <laughs> like when there was a story and you felt like you um, you couldn't have like kind of like neutral thing, and you had to go for one side like that. Okay, and I think that's a very good question, and that's also something that has come up a lot. And as a person who's in this career every day as well. It's, it's something that I tackle, which is that there's, of course, an idea of an agreed truth, but there's also often this idea of people saying that you should get both sides of a story. But the, the, the case is that like, if there's an agreed like, set of facts, for example, climate change, you know, like um, there's, a, there's an Australian publication here that's run by academics. And last year, they made a very controversial decision where they said, we will not run anything about climate deniers because that's just not something that's happening. We're not going to give them any more air. It's just not something we're going to do as an editorial policy. And I get that because, I well, false equivalence is the academic word that we've been taught in uni to use, which is, you know, like get both sides of the story and give both equal weightage. But in some cases, like things like this, where there's an agreed set of facts, why argue with people who are just not even trying to get to like a point of agreement, but just trying to like yell? Yes, Kabir. Hi, Ria. Thank you so much for coming in today and sharing your perspectives. Thank my you for question is, me. my question is kind of like building onto that last question. But as a student yeah. interested in the current affairs and political aspect of journalism. I realize that unfortunately that sort of critical writing has kind of become really controversial right now, right? And I know that you yourself have written written on like several taboo topics, such as your piece on Zanzibar tourism and the Freddie Mercury tours. And like, even as a school magazine, we've had to cut out pieces recently that were too considered too politically sensitive, right? So I just wanted to know what your advice was as to how one should really approach controversial topics, how you need to navigate that story. And how do you also kind of reach out to that other side of the audience, right? I mean, people definitely have opinions, but how do you really reach out to the other side without, let's say, offending them? Oof, that is a that is a tough one. But okay, these are all things that I battle on a day to day basis as well. Because as like, sometimes I'll have an argument with my editor because we'll just disagree on fundamental things like this, you know. 
But um, well, for one, it's it's so lovely to know that you read my piece um, on Ferry Mercury. That was the one that I really enjoyed writing. Um, as for reaching out to people on the other side, I think that we do live in a world where there's so much information out there that you can have that temptation to want to be like, I want to get everybody to read my story. But sometimes that's not going to happen. And that's perfectly fine. Because so, your job is not to like answer every single person's question in the whole world, but to do it to the best of your ability to, and kind of to go back into your question of like controversial content. Um, when you work for a publication, every publication is going to have their own code of ethics, the things that they stand by, the things that they don't. And this is also kind of why freelance works, you know, like if one place is not going to share your story, there's five other places that might like, you know, step up and also be willing to share it. So the beauty of this is also that you should never feel limited by like, oh, this person said, no, I guess the story has to go and die. No, it doesn't. It really doesn't. You just need to like step up. And especially if you really believe in something, find some other place that's going to give you that voice. If not, there's medium. You can self-publish it if you really believe in the story that you're sharing, you know? So controversial content is has always existed, but it's especially in the last 10 years that um, more things than ever are marked controversial. I think that's a good way to put it. Um, and... It's your job as someone who's interested in this to answer who, what, when, where, why, what happens now. But it's also it's not part of your job to have to answer every person's follow up, especially if it's not genuine inquiries, but it's just to demean you, to undermine you. And that's often what happens on social media. So, yeah, we live in pretty difficult times. And I, I hope I answered your question because it was it was a whammy. That was a tough one. Um, and it's something that I'm constantly still trying to answer myself. So I can't pretend to be an expert on it. But Thank you so much. Yes, ma'am. Yes. Yeah, all right. Uh, so on, like, I really want to get good at writing, right? But I'm not great at it. So then uh, as a high school student, like, how much time do you think we should dedicate, like, for day let's say uh should we uh, get, like for example i have two hours of free time in the night right so out of that half a uh, half hour goes in dinner right so then and then we need to go to sleep early everything else so there's one hour left should i give that to reading like gaining more information or should i give that to practicing my writing right because uh i get really demotivated by the fact that i don't have any good original ideas and then mm. the only way to fix that is to read more but at the same time like i don't have the brain power to read more by the end of the day right so then like is there any way around that that was a very good question um just to make sure that i've understood it you mean specifically like um non-fiction writing so like journalism and stuff like that or do you also mean creative academic uh like um I want to focus on journalism, but uh, basically expanding on ideas given in books. Mm. Okay. Whew. Okay. Um, I do think it's important to read a lot, especially in terms of different styles of writing, because the kind of writing you read on The Wire is going to be very different from The New Yorker, is going to be very different from The Times of India, you know? Um, and exposure to different types of writing is crucial in understanding what your own voice is. Because honestly, when you read something and you can just tell that it's just spitting facts as compared to weaving a story, like you just instinctively know it as a reader, you know? So it's very important to kind of like try to explore that voice. And yes, I know that this is something that you possibly knew but might not have wanted to hear, which is you just got to keep writing. Like, even if it's something as simple as, like, what movie did you watch yesterday? Why did you like it? Why did you not like it? What would you have done differently? Just write a review, you know? That's a style of writing that's giving you practice. But it's also fun because it's something that you enjoy writing about, you know? And in terms of original topics, you're right. It is exhausting. Um, 
working as a journalist means that like you're constantly having to like produce 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 but after a point like right now I'm in lockdown I've been in lockdown for about eight weeks now so sometimes I sit here like there's no stories happening but that's not true it's happening you just need to like truly search for it so um for someone like you who's starting out I think one good place would be what are the things that you're interested in like if you were just scrolling through Twitter or Facebook right now what story would you just stop and be like oh that's pretty cool is it sports is it movies is it current affairs that's a great place to start and then from there kind of going into okay within sports i like football within football okay ronaldo has moved to manchester united what do i have to say about that you know it's really about like just kind of cutting through the fat and just starting off with what you care about what you're interested in and you're not going to be the only person you know there's like a thousand other boys sitting around wanting to hear about ronaldo more about ronaldo so that's one way to start. But then on the flip side, I will also say that it's also really important to read about things that you don't care about, especially if you want to be a journalist. I am not a financial person, but sometimes I just got to sit and like read this stuff, you know, because it's a part of just knowing yourself, you know, like a little bit of exposure. No one's asking you to be an expert, but it's so important to read top, like different kinds of topics and just making yourself a little more aware it can be so tiring when you feel like there's so much out there you're like how much is one person supposed to know and nobody knows everything but it's a good place to start just read 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 write about what you care about write about something you really didn't like like if something recently happened that you do not agree with whatsoever that's a style of writing too to talk about why you disagreed with them what would you do differently stuff like that and I mean, based on my time at Inventure, um, there's so much, there's so many great writing resources there. The professor, like the teachers really like give you so much good information on how to like write well, how to build an argument. So I'd make the most of my English classes. I used to write like short stories every time. And some of them ended up, ended up coming really well, ended up coming out really well. All right. Uh, 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 yes. Please. Did anyone else have a question though before he? No. Okay. Uh, yeah. Uh, yes. So sorry. Yeah. Quickly, one more thing. We mm -hmm. have your grade twelve um, in the call as well. Um, the common question we get is, um, where can I publish what I'm writing? The online places which they can explore, or um, some really good competitions related to writing, which they can take part. So what, what something which you know, which you think they should explore at this point. Okay. Um, so I didn't really publish any of my own creative writing until maybe the first or second year of uni really. And the way that I went about it is again, I just kind of look back at like, what are the, what are the websites that I'm visiting, you know, cause they're clearly the places that I'm getting my stuff and it's the stuff that I'm interested in. So why not, try it out so i would look at um thought catalogs a great piece mediums doing a lot of stuff there's no there's literally nothing wrong with self-publishing it's become such a burgeoning industry in the last decade but i think a really good place to start is the the places that the websites that you are currently visiting find find a contact there approach an editor maybe send a pitch stuff like that that would be a very good starting point of course and this is the most cheesy thing but like LinkedIn, you know, like reach out to alumni, reach out to other people who have been where you are, because they might be working somewhere or they might know someone who is working somewhere that you are interested in. Um, but the most important thing is honestly to write, like don't not write something because you don't think anyone's going to publish it. I used to do that. And it was one of the biggest mistakes I made because, you know, people care. You just need to like put it out there. It's like a um, good thing to do, maybe by to start a blog, like maybe could that be a cool thing or like a place to start or something like that? Well, um, I think, and this is possibly controversial, which is perfectly fine, but I think that everyone's always told to start a blog, they start a blog and then within three months, it just disappears, you know? So it, it's a commitment. And especially now, like years later, 
when um, recently, like there was a there was a place that accepted my poetry, and they were like, "Oh, do you have a website we can link to?" And I was like, "No, I don't, because I never made one, and I really regret it." But I also knew that at the time when I was when I had the resources and the time to put together a website, I wasn't gonna be able to commit to it and like keep it going. So, so yeah, um, I would recommend starting a blog because it's it's good practice, and especially if you can have the discipline to be like, I will write something once a week or once in 10 days, you know, just keep it going. But the cardinal mistake that a lot of people make is just like letting it die out. But yeah, it's it's not a bad idea at all, really. Yes, Rinmai. So um, I have like a two part question. The okay. first is um, uh, working in journalism, how are your deadlines like? Are they very fixed or for you are they quite flexible um it it depends on the kind of story and the kind of publication because for example um the place that i currently work at we put out a newsletter twice a week which is tuesdays and saturdays so if i do a story on like a friday and my editor really really likes it which means she really wants it on saturday i have to put it in within 24 hours or i miss the deadline and she's just not going to put it in the newsletter you know so um Okay, bye, Mook. <laughs> and um, yeah, but on the flip side, there's a lot of places as well that want you to do a really good job with the story, take your time with it. And that can also be a very good thing because some of the best investigative journalism has taken months, years sometimes, you know. And uh, deadlines can be flexible. It requires a lot of communication, like to be upfront, especially when I was freelancing as well. You just have to tell the person that I can do it in five days and that like, we want it tomorrow. You can I can send it in five days. I can't send it in 24 hours. So there's a lot of communication that you need to have with editors. Um, some things will be very tight deadlines, but if you're upfront from the get-go of like, I can't do this in 24 hours, that's not the kind of writer that I am and I want to do a very good job with this. I'm going to take four days. A lot of people really respect that. Yeah, so um, I also wanted to ask, like when it comes to times where you kind of get to decide your own time frame. How do you like decide it's time to like let go of your piece and stop working on it again and again and again? Okay. Um, one place to start is to have a very clear idea of what's your word count. Because if they're only giving you 900 words and you're writing 1800, there's no point taking three days, right? They're not going to consider that. So one would be word count. Two would be in your head, having a clear idea of what you wanted the story to set out, because I'm also one of those people who never thinks that my story is perfect, right? But if I knew that this is what I wanted to say, and by the end of the story, I have said it, then I have done my job. I'm just nitpicking after a point. It helps to get someone else to also read your piece, because sometimes you're so close to a story that you just think you've said everything, and then the other person's like, what's this? And what's this? And you're like, oh, no, I, I never explained that because I knew it. Nobody else did. So a second pair of eyes, third pair of eyes is also great. Um, it's a process and it's something that really comes with time as well. Because the more you write, the more you, you know, perfect your craft for lack of a better word. You really start to understand where you excel. I am one of those people who does best in like a last minute panic. It's really sad, but sometimes like if I have something that's due at 10 a.m., I will wake up at four in the morning just in a panic because I can't sleep and then write some of my best work then, you know? So it's also about just fig figuring out your own writing style and doing what works best for you. Yeah. So, yeah. Yes, Mudu, did you still have your um, question though? No, no, I'll go after Kabir. Okay, yes. Go ahead, Kabir. Yeah, sure. Um, no, I was just kind of like, you know, so I'm aware like the industry has kind of like undergone like a fundamental change in the last few years. And, you know, it's no longer the same industry we've seen a few decades ago. And you spoke of this a bit earlier as well, right? When you mentioned how you were kind of like uh, looking for stories on Twitter and Facebook. But do you really think, like, I just want to understand, like, what kind of a role does the internet and like social media have when influencing your writings, like when you're finding your next topic, when you're looking at perspective building, like how big of a role does it play and like what do you recommend? Okay. Um, based on my own experience in the last few years, the internet has done such a great job of just bringing stories to you. So it's definitely not a resource to be taken lightly. 
um some stories can also just come to you based on conversations you know there's it's a lot of this needs the approach of just being open to stories open to conversations open to ideas because the minute you're just like yeah i'm good and then there's someone sitting opposite you or like a party like a friend of a friend who's got something really cool that they're doing but you just won't listening you know so offline there are opportunities but i think online currently especially in like the pandemic is where so much of the story is i would encourage you to like also just follow a lot of people so cuz even if they're not doing anything right now one day on your feed you'll just suddenly find that they're going to be doing something really cool like a very interesting event in like 3 days and you're going to be following them so you know that story so it's about following a lot of publications following a lot of people and in terms of perspective i think that's a very that's a very loaded question but i think that's a very good one because part of being a good journalist is also knowing what the other side is saying you know so like i sometimes read op india it's not my favorite publication but i read it because you need to know what what the other what the other side believes what the other side thinks that's not to say that they're wrong it's just a difference of opinion and yeah it's it's about building that that world view you know like i'm not going to say that i'm a, like an expert on like what's happening in kashmir or what's happening in israel but like it's also just about knowing what different people are saying for what people are saying against you don't even have to like necessarily figure out exactly where you stand you just need to know enough about both sides to be able to talk about it because that's also part of your job right thank you so much yeah what okay. news of rahul how's he doing rahul is doing well he is um he's now into data analytics and data science so for everyone my uh, my younger brother rahul was also an inventor so he was there for about 5 years i want to say um and yeah no he's he's into data analytics and data science now which is such a shift i suppose from um high school but yeah he and he's doing very well running around on his bikes inside the uh the corridors <laughs> <laughs> how is he right now <laughs> He has now um settled for just like killing it at the gym every day but um yeah you know he found his he found his outlet for sure very cool and awesome <laughs> story as well really sorry kind of got my no. <laughs> no of course so uh, this is this is a new experience and i apologize if i've rambled a lot guys because there's there's just so much to say that sometimes i also get a little flustered but um yes that's my email id if you guys have any more questions i was going to i did note this down because i knew that i'd get like this which is the the main stuff that i think that you should take away from this um so the first thing would be um really putting yourself out there you know like you need tough skin but you also really need um that little sensitive approach to certain topics um i would say plenty of reading being sociable like even if you're not a particularly social person like it's it's not your first instinct to just like go up to a stranger and start talking to them i think it is important in a career in the media so this is not just journalism but also you know like advertising pr because there's so many other avenues that you can always look into as well it's about just being able to have a conversation finding common ground and just being sociable and open to conversations because you really never know where that leads and let's be fair that probably is the case with every career ever you know um so it's just always a good lesson for you guys to take away um this is something that i the next point which is um editing if for whoever here is interested in editing you know like if you're not someone who's who wants to be a journalist or someone who wants to be um in front of like a screen but you're just someone who really enjoys looking over other people's work and making it better and editing it it can feel very thankless in the sense of i have been there where someone has sent in a story because i also work as a copy editor as at my current um organization and someone will send in a story and you have basically edited 70% of it like it may as well have by riana at you know but it's someone else's idea and you may have made all those changes but that's part of being an editor as well you know like sometimes you just got to take one for the team and that's something that you should all keep in mind because there have been times that i've been very frustrated but it is a part of the job you know part of editing means not getting the credit as well 
and there's lots of opportunities. Yes. Yeah, I want to know. <clears throat> Were you ever told that, sorry, you're a woman, you can't take that topic on? Did you ever feel that way? Have you ever come across that situation? It's too dangerous. It's not something you should write about. You're a woman. Specifically that. Thankfully, I can say that that has never been like let's said directly to my face. I have no idea how I'd even react if someone told me that, you know. But um, there have been certain like topics, like for example, there was a piece that I wanted to write about like contraception, you know, and someone at the time was like, oh, being a woman, why do you want to talk about it? It's, it's a pretty important topic, whether you're a man or a woman, it doesn't really matter. But like the editor at the time was like, this is a little taboo. We'd rather a man write it. And that was a, that's a horrible thing to like, he insinuated it, he didn't say it. But that's a terrible thing to hear. And it's, that's where the tough skin has to come in. Um, unfortunately, we do stay in a society and like a global community where some people do believe that there's that difference and it's tough it's tough but um thankfully i've never had to like personally fight and be like yes i'm a woman and i will write that story that's never happened but um thank you <laughs> yeah, yeah of course well let me just make sure that i didn't miss out on anything Mm -hmm. uh, Ria, we have uh, yes. Preet Nam and Nirain Ma'am on call, right? So if you want yes. to say something, if you want to speak something to them. <laughs> well, um, hi Preet Nam, I haven't, like, I'm, I'm so sorry, like, the, the cameras are just moving all over the place. But no, I mean, one thing that's um, always cool to mention here is all the great opportunities that I was handed to lead me here. And just being open to conversations, being open to like every opportunity that's been given to you and maintaining connections. I know it's something that I, it's, um, it can be tough. It's uh, something that I can't say that I have had a hundred percent success rate in, but like maintaining connections is also a huge part of the occupation. It's huge something to take away as well. And of course, nice to see you guys. It's great to see you and hear you. When we heard these were happening, we kind of twisted Ramesh and Somitra's arm to make sure that we were also invited. <laughs> because what's really cool for us is to see our graduates grow up and go into the world. And we're just so proud of how confident, articulate, what thinking people you all are. So you're the pudding, actually. You know, when they say the truth lies <laughs> in the pudding. So awesome to see you and hear you. All the best. Thank you. <laughs> and yeah, it's something I brought up as well, where like when um, the call started, when I got the invitation, actually, a week ago, like there's almost that sense of imposter syndrome where you're like, what have I really done to be able to talk about? But apparently I do have stuff to talk about because I've talked for an hour. So... <laughs> <laughs> Uh, somebody save her. Soumya said hi. Nurin turned her camera on. Um, yes. Man, is, is this what it's like to take online classes? To like look at the chat and also talk and answer yeah. questions? And, oh, try hybrid class, Ria. Yeah, try hybrid. <laughs> Can't imagine. Yeah. Uh, yeah, of course, Madhit. So my email is in the chat. I'm always happy to answer questions. Um, I had so much to say that I'm so sure that there's stuff that I would have missed out on. So if you guys have anything you want to chat about, I'm always happy to um, take questions. And yeah, I mean, add me on LinkedIn. Apparently that's a thing we all say now, but like it could help. <laughs> yeah, I'm just curious. Did you work with uh, Chiki, Sarkar and Penguin? No, but I um, heard a lot. So like, because I worked in a different department, like I worked in in Puffin, so it was children's and young adults. So I was no, just... she's my student. I, I asked, she was my student. Oh, really? <laughs> what a small world. <laughs> no, I heard a lot. But again, like I, I, and at the time I was the intern, like, and everybody else seemed so well read and so wise and had so much to say that I would, I would just quietly sit there and just like read my stories all day long. Thank you so much, Rhea.
um so uh, we have your email id we will share it with the students who get in touch with us yes yeah. uh, but thank you so much for taking time uh, and joining us today thank you so much this was wonderful <laughs> i will be emailing you for more information dear thank you so much cool thank thanks you. for taking the time out guys and uh, enjoy the rest of your days feel free to reach out and good luck with everything that everyone's doing Bye. Bye. Take care, Ria. Thank you. Stay safe. Thank you so much. Thank you. Bye. Bye, Ria. Thank you. Bye. 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 Bye.